This meeting is being recorded. Go for it, Ellen. Um, are you going to spotlight all of our panelists with me, or is that not possible? Can you only, how many people can you spotlight? Maisie will be spotlighting them. And I don't okay. need to be spotlight. So uh, thank you for those stories. That was lovely. This has all been, it's been such a great day filled with music and art and story. Um, I know that those first couple of days, as you all know, uh, Mugda and I tried to give you that 30,000 feet version of these traditions. And then we have three panels where we have actual practitioners of the traditions who are each going to talk a little bit about what these traditions mean to them and what they think school teachers should know about these. I have to say this particular panel is amazing. I'm really excited for this. We have uh, Bhante Kusala and Vandan Sadhak, who are religious leaders within their traditions who are going to be uh, speaking from that perspective. And uh, we have Samani Chaitanya Pragya and Nikki Gurinder Singh, who hopefully will show up, who are eminent scholars uh, of their traditions while also being practitioners and leaders in their traditions. So this is, I mean, this is really an incredible group. And I am so excited to, to get your wisdom. Nikki, you can read their full. Excuse me, Nikki is here. Oh, hello. Welcome. Hello, Dr. Singh. Dr. Singh, we'll get you up and there you go. Okay, great. Sorry, Ellen, go. Fantastic. So now we have our whole group of four eminent teachers, practitioners, scholars of these traditions. You can read their full bios at the bottom of your program. I don't want to take this time to do that, but you will see just how accomplished all four of these people are. And, uh, and so what I just want to ask each of you, and you'll go in turn, so each of you will have about 15 minutes to talk about what, what this tradition means to you. What is it about your tradition that you identify most with that you would want K-12 teachers to know? And I just want you all to know that we've been getting a lot of questions from these teachers about what is the most important thing when they're teaching this tradition to be aware of or to be aware of a, a misconception where they might mess up um, or accidentally offend someone and also how to be sensitive to students of your tradition who are in their classrooms. So those are, are really the questions that we have for you. And so we'll just go in the order that's on the program here and start with Venerable Bhante Kusala, thank you so much for being here. For inviting, I'm happy to be here. So I guess you all can see my screen. I'm sharing the screen now. Great, so I put together some slides so I can kind of uh, help you with some of the images that I will be sharing. Uh, and you can see here, there's a little monk looking at some grapes. Um, and you, look, you can also see his kind of worn out robe, you know, a little monk being a little careless about his robe. So that is the living tradition of Buddhism, you know, just infants, maybe he started, maybe he was 10 or a um, little older as he, maybe even younger as he joined the order. The goal of all of us becoming monks is to attain Nirvana. And I must, be sincere here that, you know, uh, we do everything but nirvana <laughs> in our living of life. And somehow all these things that we do seems to connect with that larger goal, whether we are uh, practicing meditation or helping people when they were hit by that tsunami uh, or um, doing social services, hospital counseling or anything we do seems to fulfill uh, this goal. And I like to share my beginnings, especially when I grew up with my parents. Uh, we had a small shrine room like this. In that shrine room, 
My father had a bunch of deities also on the side. Uh, I think I have a slide about that, but I, I, let me also stop here for a moment. You can see some drinks being offered to the Buddha. And on the right hand side, there is a Buddha statue in the center. There's also, there are also small statues on sides. And there's also a picture of one of the monks from Sri Lanka. So that is where I come from. And um, Sri Lanka is majority Buddhist country. About 70% people are Buddhist. So where I grew up, there were no Christians, no Muslims, and uh, no Hindu. So, uh, but my, I later understood that my father was, like you can see the second image here, you know, in the center there's a Buddha statue, on uh, either side there's Ganesh and there's also another deity. So local deities and Vishnu and all of that were familiar to us and he had shlokas and gathas that he chanted and he felt like if he didn't do his chanting every day, um, some deity would come and push him off the bed at night. So that kind of instilled some fear in us. So we also did those chantings. But he didn't have that fear toward the Buddha. So that's something I'd like to highlight here. So, um, and these also have purposes, like if, if, our, if we did worship, if, the, if we did any offerings to Saraswati goddess, that was to help us with education. Uh, so we wouldn't go to the Buddha for that. We would go to Saraswati for that purpose. And in, in different localities in Sri Lanka, you find Ganesha or Shivalinga or different things and depending on what people believed. And uh, I think um, so, some of you know that Sri Lanka has Tamils in, in, in some places, in Northern places mostly. And they um, they don't they don't believe anything about the Buddha, so they have many deities from their Hindu uh, traditions. So uh, that is basically how I grew up, and um, and also we had an image of uh, Venerable Sivali for prosperity at home because we were poor and we needed more money coming, and we thought Sivali is is a way to attract prosperity to, to the house. That's how our parents thought. But later when I became a monk, I was 16, and I realized this is not how the Buddha taught Buddhism. So it took me a bit of learning, reading scripture. Um, and I kind of thought maybe this is these offerings and lighting candles and offering uh, fragrances, flowers, they have some cultural value. And it's so hard to take them off from my grandparents or parents because they want to show gratitude to the Buddha. Um, and these all had these symbolic meanings, like you offer candles to dispel uh, dark, darkness of ignorance and the fragrances represented your virtues and flowers are symbolic of your um, learning of impermanence and offering food uh, meant that you are kind of looking after the Buddha like a king and showing gratitude to him. And people believe that when you do a puja like that, an offering like that, you will receive in abundance. So that's what people believed. And I went to Sunday Dhamma school before, before I became a monk. And after I became a monk, I began teaching in Sunday Dhamma schools. Uh, in Dharma schools, we had a uniform like that, very distinct. Uh, so it, this happened uh, every Sunday, and there is a graduation after you attend 12 classes of Sunday school. And in those Sunday schools, there are devotional singings, uh, competitions. So, and you sit on the floor when you are chanting, and you go into a classroom and uh, study. Buddhism and Buddhist stories. Um, and this thing came from uh, after the Protestant Buddhism became a thing in Sri Lanka. You know, it was informed by uh, some missionaries to Sri Lanka. And also in Sri Lankan Buddhist um, culture, we have many sacred shrines. Like there's a whole list of those 
in here, like the rock cave temple in Dambulla, Isurumunia, Jetavan, and all these, you know, especially huge shrines in Anuradhapura, where the relics of the Buddha are reposed, and people have so much faith and devotion toward these places. So these places are very far, and most Sri Lankans don't have a vehicle, so they hire a vehicle and they love to spend a couple of days touring around and uh, making offerings to these places and these places have become also wealthy because of that because people's offerings so they do many charity projects this is a slide i think i should have put sooner so you can see buddhism buddhist is about 70 percent and there's 12 percent or so about hindus in sri lanka and 9.7% Muslims and also 6.2% Roman Catholic and 1.4% of other and Christian traditions in, in the country. And monks on arms round can be seen in the morning, uh, in, in the first half of the day. Uh, these are monks known to me. These monks are uh, begging for food but it's not a common sight because now people bring food. Even here where I, where I live in Toronto, people bring our breakfast and lunch and it is a huge merit-making event. So we never had to cook at these temples. And even today we were invited for lunch in Oakville here in Toronto to transfer merits to their departed relatives. And it's a very important part um, in Buddhist culture. And you can imagine, after a tsunami happened, how busy monks can get uh, being invited to many houses. And it's so hard to fulfill these uh, uh, needs because you know so many people died and only few, few monks are found in some localities. So wearing white is the tradition in uh, Sri Lankan temple culture. Uh, whether you are a student or uh, even a senior, you wear a white something that's, that is symbolic of purity. Uh, so that is not anything um, to be afraid of. Um, so even if you don't have a white cloth, you can still go. But I think you will be the attention of the crowd because you are not wearing uh, white in the temple. This is me teaching Dhamma to kids in Detroit. So they are seated in front of us and they like to, uh, especially parents here, love, love us monks to speak in English and teach Dhamma to kids and uh, to teach them manners and stories. So these elephant stories or mango stories and any story we find, we, we remember them or take notes so we can share with the kids the next time we happen to teach. So it can be any time, any place. So we also have processions culture uh, where people bring these fans and eight requisites, the thing they are holding in yellow in the center, and also a lot of drummers. So, and also elephants involved. So monks in urban settings, they have Sunday schools and they teach uh, kids like that. And monks in forest settings, they don't teach in Sunday schools. They just focus more on meditation and their personal growth, personal practice. And this is the nature of a forest monk. They just have simple belongings, just an umbrella and their ball, and there's, they don't even have uh, slippers. And we also have a new tradition called Mahameunawa tradition. They, uh, they started like revealing uh, more difficult Sinhalese translations of the Pali Canon into a simplified Sinhalese translation and it became popular and more people started listening to those monks so the places got bigger and many branches were established throughout the country. And also we have political monks, monks who are into politics. They are criticized heavily but they still do politics anyways and mostly monks from universities like in the first image on top uh, left. These are monks participating in a protest um kind of taking parts in one of the parties which is not something the buddha would approve but they do it anyway so this is kind of people's people got used to seeing monks on stage and the last image is where the cardinal meeting one of these 
monks who is in a um, who is in, who is doing fasting to deliver a message to the to the parliament. And we do social services, and this is a monk sharing dry food. And this is a picture in the center. I took this picture when I uh, encouraged kids from Sunday school to bring dry food and share with this lady who, who was poor. So dana, generosity is part of our you know, practices. We also have nuns in our Buddhist culture. These are little monks, and you can see he was given a bunch of fire, firecrackers. I don't think his teacher liked the idea. But anyways, people love giving things to these little monks because there are only few and they are seen as you know little kids who have these vicious you now and uh, play playful minds and here's a university monk um, and there's a muslim girl behind when it rained she held her notebooks on his head so that this monk is covered from rain and this is a full, the full moon day culture is a big thing in Sri Lanka. Every full moon day, the government offices are closed, encouraging people to go to temples and observe, being, uh, observing their precepts and listening to monks. And monks attend from birth to death all the events, you know, including funerals, where we teach about impermanence and also give some solidarity, some support to people who are mourning the deaths of uh, their beloved ones. And this is an almsgiving, um, monks invited and um, offered with delicious food. This is a common sight in Sri Lanka. And they also have something annoying, loudspeakers, <laughs> like in India and many Asian countries. I hate that. <laughs> every morning it's like a competition and you don't need an alarm 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 clock you get used to listening to this and sometimes you just sleep without caring what you hear and in candy we have the tooth relic temple in sri lanka this is where the left tooth relic of the buddha is uh, reposed and this is a sacred site and every tourist are directed to this place by the government Visak is a huge celebration, celebrating the birth and enlightenment and passing away of the Buddha. Um, and we also do, this is my last slide, um, the, we also do uh, animal rescue uh, because we have slaughterhouses in Sri Lanka and it has become a business. Sometimes when it comes to the full moon day, um, those people in slaughterhouses uh, steal cows and animals from other people and set a huge price so that they know Buddhist people and monks come and rescue them, no matter what price label they have put. So there is discussions about how to stop that from happening. Anyways, sometimes, you know, monks don't uh, respect the a letter of the law, they would break the law to respect the spirit of the law, like driving vehicles, especially when tsunami happened, people were distraught, they didn't know what to do. So monks became drivers and putting these uh, dying people into their trucks or vehicles and somehow driving them to hospitals. And then people started appreciating, um, they never criticized monks driving. So anyway, uh, I think this may have given an idea about what we live with and where we lived and how we bring this culture to the West. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That was perfectly timed. Um, if people have questions, you can put them in the chat now, but we are not going to take questions until the after all four panelists are finished. So. Um, thank you so much, Pante. And we will move on to Swami Vandan Sadak, who will speak to us about Hinduism. Um, you can see my screen, right? Yes. Thank you. Right. Um, good afternoon. 
my name is Sadak Mandan. Last week, I flew back from the US after finishing a year long special student program un under the Hindu Monastic Fellowship at Harvard Divinity School. I'm a novice monk and adherent of Swaminara and Hindu tradition. The Swaminarayan tradition is a spiritual, volunteer driven organization dedicated to improving the society through individual growth by fostering the Hindu ideals of faith, unity, and selfless service. The founder of this tradition was Bhagwan Swaminarayan, who we believe to be God. Bhagwan Swaminarayan promised to remain forever amongst us through a lineage of enlightened gurus. Accordingly, my guru Pramukh Swami Maharaj was the fifth spiritual successor in this lineage. He passed, up, he passed in 2016, and the present guru is Mahan Swami Maharaj. In today's presentation, I'll talk about single and shared Hinduism, contemplating Hinduism through my experiences at Harvard as a Hindu monastic fellow. I will talk about my personal experiences as a Hindu practitioner while in the US at Harvard, where I spent the, the last year focusing on religious studies. For me, primary goal as a practitioner of all rituals and worship, whether they are physical, physically or mentally expressed, is connecting and interacting with God. All rituals are thus contemplative um, do I, do can you make your screen full screen or does that uh, work for you uh there you go that works okay um uh, yes and I need to have my script here. Right. Um, for me, uh, the primary goal as a practitioner of all rituals and worship, whether they are physical, whether they are physically or mentally expressed, is connecting and interacting with God. All rituals are thus contemplative. They involve contemplating or meditating on God while understanding God's profound greatness. In this regard, I, will, I always remember one of the sermons offered by Bhagwan Swami Narayan. He says, if a person lovingly performs puja or worship of God with emotions and faith, then regardless of whether he performs, he or she performs puja physically or mentally, both are of equal importance. It is vital that my worship is not just physical or mechanical, but that it involves my mind or bhava, my feelings, my love, or my emotion. There are three, there are mainly three ways I perform my daily practices. First are physical rituals, which are dedicated times during which I meditate on God's murti or image, as well as my true identity, myself as an Atman or soul. These rituals include Aarti, the waving of a lighted wick around God's Murti or image of God, and Thal, offering, devotionally offering God food that I prepare for myself. Even though these rituals are offered physically in my Ghar Mandir or a home temple, home shrine, where I keep the images of God, they facilitate in my connection with God. Second are mental rituals which is called Mansi Puja, in which I contemplate on God and mentally offer devotion. For example, in the morning when I wake, I wake up God and after, and after leading God through morning acts, such as brushing and bathing, I offer God breakfast. And this meditation continues all throughout my day at various points, such as lunch and dinner. I can be creative with this practice as I offer things that I personally enjoy, such as my favorite foods. I can also seasonally adapt in my offering. For example, in winter, I offer warm soup and in summer, ice cream. The third type of practice I do is seva or devotional service, it, which is expressed both physically and mentally. Seva includes, for me, serving people and community and thinking about the virtues of my peers and professors and all. My late guru, Pramukh Swami Maharaj, whose centennial birth anniversary is celebrated worldwide this year, would often say that in the joy of others lies our own. 
which I attempt to embody in my life through prioritizing the needs of others when, whenever possible before mine and doing this as a means of devotion and pleasing God. While doing all of these practices, I remember what my guru teaches me in this scripture called Satsang Diksha. I read it every morning to find new inspiration and ideals to follow and embody. For example, I will recite two Sanskrit shlokas from the text and then offer a translation. Seva bhakti kathadhyana tapo yatra di sadhanam manato dambato naiva karyam naivershaya tatha svardhaya dveshato naiva na laukika falechaya shaddhaya shuddha bhavena karyam prasannata dhiya the translation, one should never perform seva, devotion, discourses, meditation, austerities, pilgrimages, and other endeavors out of vanity, pretense, jealousy, competition, enmity, or for attainment of worldly fruits. However, they should be performed with faith, pure intention, and the wish to please Bhagwan. All of these practices come together to form a better version of myself as a Hindu and as an individual living in society. For the latter half of the presentation, I will focus on community-based practices, specifically the diverse festivals celebrated throughout, through, throughout the year. As a Hindu, getting together to celebrate these festivals for the purpose of creating memories, which I can relish for years to come, is crucial. It is understood in my traditions that, that the memories collected from these incidents help one elevate spiritually and attain moksha or salvation. Hinduism comprises traditions marked by their unique, unique festivals. As an eminent Sanskrit poet, Kalidasa says, Utsava Priya Khalu Manavaha, humans indeed love festivals. Every single month in the calendar is marked with an at least one auspicious festival that brings joy and togetherness in Hindus. Annakut, Bhaiduj, Lori, Makar Sankranti, Pongal, Vasant Panchmi, Kavdi, Mahashivratri, Holi, Vasant Navratri, Ram Naomi, or Swamina and Jayanti, Cheti Chand, Vat Savitri, Rathyatra, Rathyatra is by the way next week, Guru Purnima, Onam, Rakshabandhan, Janmasmi, Ganesh Chaturthi, Navratri, Vijayadashmi, Narak Chaturdashi, and ending the Hindu year with Diwali and Lakshmi Poochan, and then starting again the new year with Annakut, in which a heap of food items is offered to favorite deity. These are to name a few famous ones, but there are many more. In this image on my screen, you can see like heaps of sweets and vegetarian items offered to uh, Bhagwan Swami Narayan and Bhagwan Ram and others. The, day, the days of Diwali are my favorite festival days. Most vividly, Diwali is a festival of lights and of variety of foods devotionally offered to God. It involves a remembrance of Bhagwan Ram and Sita Ji, Hanuman Ji, Ganesh Ji, Kali Ji and Lakshmi Ji among other deities. It involves rituals performed over the course of five days, culminating with Annakut on day four, where a mountain of devotionally prepared food is offered to God. Diwali for me also involves the coming together, not just of the family, but of a community as a family. To me, the festival represents a concept known in my tradition as Sam, which can be roughly translated as unity, but also understanding, empathy, and friendship. These festivals take place at homes and at mandirs or Hindu temples. The importance of mandirs as a place of worship where you can offer darshan, thal and arti and community, finding a family, a home away from home, a place to eat, a place to make friends, a place to hang out. And the importance of mandirs as a place of education where Hindus can demonstrate their practices to others and others can come to learn about values. Through our experiences together, we are not just celebrating the festival of Diwali, but strengthening our bonds as a community. As I end, I want to recall here my experience of organizing and celebrating Diwali at Harvard this past year. As a president of Hindu, as the president of HDS Hindu group, I had the chance to celebrate this event. It truly showed me that celebrating festival is about creating memories together and solidifying bonds with each other while collectively worshiping God. For this celebration, my friends, though from different traditions and religions, were supportive of this endeavor and helped me organize this whole event. 
along with it being an opportunity to explain my faith and festival to my peers it was an opportunity to understand ev that everyone is ready to understand and connect with each other at a deeper level we just have to try unity among people of different faiths and faiths and culture is built through conversation and conversation is facilitated through celebration of festivals i learned from my experience at harvard not that not just that day of celebrating diwali but throughout my year there that one to one conversations and even group group conversations are means through which we can build con connections with people of different faiths because it is those conversations that have the greatest potential to generate deeper understanding and respect for one another to explain it this in simpler terms the satsang diksha says one should never have contempt for other religions sampradayas or its followers one should never criticize them and should always treat them with respect and love this year we are celebrating the cent centenary of my guru pramukh swami maharaj his 100th anniversary 100th birth anniversary one saying which is which his life life exemplified was in the joy of others lies our own i pray as i conclude that i can embody this truth in my life as he has through his thank you so much thank you so much swami ji that was wonderful and um again if people have questions you can put them in the chat now and we can get to them later and we will wait until the end so our next speaker is samani chaitanya pragya who will be speaking about jainism you're muted let's let's un, can you unmute yourself um Maisie, can you unmute her? Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Yes. So one minute I am sharing my presentation. slides are visible to everybody yes correct perfect good afternoon to everybody it is my pleasure to share some of the experience and some of the knowledge about jainism everybody knows about all the indian traditions so Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism are all the three traditions are very, very ancient traditions of India. They are deeply rooted in Indian soil. So Jainism is one of them, uh, and uh, two other traditions you have already heard. Since I am practicing Jainism and uh, disseminating uh, Jain principles and practices throughout the world. visiting different universities and recently i am working at florida international university where we have opened jain chair and uh, i am teaching some jain principles just uh, uh, i want to say that uh, what kind of unique uh, principles uh, jainism is having uh, so we are we would discuss on those basic principles in this particular talk we have limited time i will not take much more time just we know that every religion has some ideal person uh, whose life is followed by the fo followers of that particular tradition so in jainism uh, we have tirthankars uh, who are given given supreme importance in uh, religious as a religious authority and we also believe in infinite number of siddhas uh, they are known as liberated souls they are accepted as the spiritual god they are god they are not the creator god 
but they are spiritual. They are completely engrossed in themselves and enjoy everlasting peace and infinite knowledge in liberated state. According to Jainism, in each time cycle, uh, we have two epochs. In each epoch, we get almost 24 Tirthankars. They teach uh, the same philosophy, same things in their times in the uh, and in the language of their times. So in this particular era, we have also 24 Tirthankars. The list starts with Lord Risha, who was the first Tirthankar, and Lord Mahavir he was the last Tirthankar. So just he was uh, in the 2,600 uh, years before, he was born in Bihar, uh, Patna uh, district, and uh, you can see in Magar. And uh, he, whatever he taught in his time, we are discussing those things in this particular talk. So just we have to see that he said that human life must have some particular goal and that goal must be highest goal, not just the temporary goals which we make in our day-to-day -day life. So the what, what is the highest goal or ultimate goal of human life? He said that it is self-realization. You have to believe in your own existence and you have to realize the uh, beauty of your own inner self. What are the path to realize our own soul. Then he talked about three things that Samyak Darshan, Samyak Jnana and Samyak Charitra. Samyak Darshan means that you have to believe in your own independent existence of soul. You are not creation of anybody but you have your own individual and independent existence. So you must have a strong faith in your own existence. Second is some again means you have to know yours, about yourself, that who are you and why you are in this particular state and what the best you can do in your life and what is the ultimate goal of your life. So you should always try to or try hard to realize your own pure being. So some charitra is the right conduct to realize the self. So these are the three main paths to realize oneself. What is the basic uh, view, uh, fundamental view uh, to locate the truth uh, of the world? So Mahavi taught about the philosophy of Anikant and Shadavad. He said that truth is multidimensional and whatever is said about the truth is always relative. And therefore there are various ways since the reality is having multi-dimensions, infinite dimensions, and you can express it in infinite ways. So uh, you have to be very much uh, tolerant to the views which are different, but related to the truth, you should accept it. So that's why Jainism teaches that you should respect all the views. <laughs> Those views, they may be different from you, but if they are talking about some reality, some truth, you have to accept and be tolerant and respect the views of other people. And there is one very good example, uh, which is all, almost a given in all our Indian traditions, especially in Buddhism and also sometimes in Hinduism, but it is very well known in uh, Jain texts that uh, there is one elephant and there are six blind people all try to see the elephant, but all touches, all touch different, different aspects of the elephant and say something different from each other. So just we have to see that all are true in, the, in their views or in their uh, observation. Uh, but until and unless we put all the views together, we cannot get the complete picture of the truth that is elephant. So similarly, uh, truth is multidimensional. All other different traditions, they are talking of, of some different aspects of reality. And we should try to understand uh, all those views also to have the bigger picture or why, uh, to see the truth in wider horizon. About the world, what is the world and how, who is created about the uh, in this world? So Jainism says that the world is eternal, it is existing forever. 
and it was in the past, it is in the present, it will always be in the future. So don't worry that it is, it is created by someone or at some point of time, it is eternal and going on as it is for the, from the time immemorial. So this is uh, uh, what Jainism has said about the world. But this universe is uh, consisting of two basic elements, which is living and non-living. These are two elements which are the most fundamental entities of the universe. The universe is consisting of these two elements. So until and unless we understand both the elements, we cannot have the complete picture of the universe. So far as the living beings are concerned, since Jainism emphasizes on the practice of non-violence, so it is necessary to understand what life is and how it is working in the universe. So according to Jainism, there are four types of uh, living beings in the universe, the heavenly beings, the human beings, the subhuman beings or animals you can say, or hellish beings. These are all worldly souls, they are in the universe. So you need not to uh, and, uh, say something that uh, the animals are not having soul or they are nothing in the universe. They have equal uh, kind of soul they are having the same kind of soul which the human beings are having. So you have to respect all the human beings, all the living beings, whatever uh, they may be, uh, in whatever form they are, but you have to respect as you want this respect from others to you. There are five types. So all the living beings have been also classified in five uh, types, one sense, two sense, three sense, four sense, five sense. So all these worldly souls come under one or other classes of the living beings. We have to understand uh, from ecological and environmental point of view, uh, we have to understand that water, fire, airs, vegetables, and uh, what we say, earth all are living com components of the universe. So we should not misuse them uh, or we should not uh, exploit them uh, without necessities. And these are also a living uh, components of the universe. So if you destroy unnecessary these natural resources, they may, it may be very uh, harmful for human existence also. So Mahavi says that uh, earth, water, fire, air, and vegetables are having the same kind of soul as the human beings are having. So be um, passionate, to, uh, what we say, compassionate to them and don't destroy them unnecessarily uh, because their existence is supporting your own existence. If you destroy unnecessary these natural resources, then it may be that uh, there will be a scarcity of these natural resources and your life can also be in, into danger. So he said that if you overlook all these uh, poor living beings, uh, thinking that they are non-living elements and you can use as much as you want. So it means you are ignoring their existence and thereby you are ignoring your own existence. And in this pandemic time, we have already seen that there was um, a scarcity of oxygen in the environment and how people died because of the pandemic. They couldn't get the sufficient oxygen during that time and could have to leave, depart from the world. So this is what uh, we have to understand that how plants are very important, why oxygen is so important for us to live in, on the earth. Now, uh, sometimes we see that we uh, face so many uh, critical situations in our life or we see face bad time in our life. And we think that, oh, this guy has given something, uh, done something wrong with me. And we blame all uh, on others uh, for our uh, misfortune. But Mahavir says that pain and pleasure are your own creation. Everybody has to pay for, beg for them right and wrong deeds. So pain and pleasure are not created by anyone. Circumstances or other people can be just an instrumental cause for uh, creating such kind of pains and pleasures. But you cannot, you should not blame them. You have to understand these all are 
your own creation. So be conscious before taking any right or wrong action. The last thing, uh, and which is the main purpose of this particular workshop, uh, that how we can unite together, how we can understand each other, how we can respect each other, and how we can accept the existence of all living beings, including all different religious uh, uh, people or religious traditions. So here Mahavi says that unity of mankind, he says that all humans are having the same blood and bones. And so they are not different from each other. We should not understand that they are different, uh, they belong to different caste, creed or color, etc. Yeah, they may have different faith um, or in different ideology, they may have different uh, ideologies, but it doesn't mean that they are different. You have to see that all humans belong to one and the same class, and that is humanity. You have to respect humanity and not see any kind of a discrimination um, among the human beings or any living beings sometimes. So it is a, a, it is a thought, and because of that, we could accept anybody, or any existence, or any living being, or any. We can live with peace with any caste, creed, or color people, and can work with them peacefully. So these are the basic teachings uh, which we have to learn at least uh, to live a peaceful life, to have uh, to respect others' view, to learn from others, and to have uh, creative and constructive uh, outlook. Uh, to leave and to let leave others. So with this, I would uh, finish my talk. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. Chaitanya Pragya. That was really illuminating. So thank you very much. And then we just have one more. So again, uh, all you participants know you can put things in the chat now, but we will get to questions after our fourth and final presenter who will talk about Sikhism, and that is uh, Dr. Singh, Dr. Nikki Singh. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to Swasti and to Ellen and Kelly. Uh, it's lovely to be in this wonderful panel. I'm really, really delighted and honored. Thanks really, Swasti, for organizing everything so beautifully. You choreograph you're really kind of my, my master, my teacher. Um, so as Ellen said, this is going to be on the Sikh tradition, S-I-K-H, uh, one of the more recent traditions, most contemporary of the lot that we have been discussing so far. And it begins with, it originates in the Punjab. Uh, and as there are less than 2% of the Indian population, but overall, I would say 26, 27 million or so worldwide. It originates in the land of Punjab, northwest of India. Uh, Panj means ah, five and Ab is river, so land of the five rivers, very fertile. And so you see a lot of people coming there, the Greeks, the Chinese, you, you know, from the Arabs, uh, the British, you name it, and people are there. And so um, it's a very kind of a pluralistic soil um, culturally, ethnically, linguistically, where the Sikh tradition originates. So we need to keep that pluralistic elements in mind. Um, so we begin with Guru Nanak. He is the founder of the tradition and uh, he's born in 1469 in the Punjab. And here, I really like this image and I keep showing it because he's wearing a robe and they say that it was given to him as a gift and the robe has Islamic verses on the one side and Sikh verses on the other. So it's very, very interesting that the Japji and the Holy Quran are on the body of the same person to kind of symbolize that he really was a person for all faiths and really as just as Professor Saab just said, you know, for humanity rather than for anybody in particular. So it's kind of opening up that diversity in Guru Nanak. And that's really the origins of the Sikh tradition. He's the one who envisioned the numeral one, one reality only. And that's where the whole tradition begins. Between Hinduism, between Islam, Buddhism, Jainism have all been a part of that soil. So you see a very versatile kind of an outlook. So this is the person. He's the beginner. We have 
10 gurus. The 10th is Guru Gobind Singh. And after he passed away, he made the book, The Guru Forever. The prime shrine, uh, sort of the Vatican for the Sikhs, the Mecca for the Sikhs is the Golden Temple, which is located in Amritsar. And as you can see, this architecture symbol has four doors. And these four doors are a you know, kind of emblem that people from all four castes are welcome. So that's what it stands for. So people for, from all castes, um, all races, all religions are equally welcome. So that's the Golden Temple in Amritsar. And it was, it was built by the fifth guru in just before to, to, to put the holy book there. He, had, he was the one who compiled and edited the Sikh scripture and to have a place for it, the um, Harmandir was created. Of course, in those days, it was a very simple building, but now um, it was under Maharaja Ranjit Singh that it was uh, coated with gold and so forth and is uh, kind of became this place as we know it in modern times. Um, this is a celebration. We somebody talked about celebrations early. The Sikhs like it too. So this is kind of you know the Indian psyche. We love celebrations, and I think it is a spring festival that is being celebrated. And you can see how many people are present at the Golden Temple, and everybody is welcome from all races and all religions. This is the book. This is the holy book. The starting point is Guru Nanak, the founder of the tradition, who I showed, whose image we show, I showed you first. And to me, the scripture is really the center of Sikh faith, center of Sikh philosophy, religion, ethics, whatever you might want to say, it, and rituals, because it's really considered to be a person. The 10 gurus are embodied in this volume. And so the book is everything. Um, so when people get married, they walk around the book four times. When somebody dies, the book is read from the beginning to the end. Every morning, people have it in their homes. Many people have it in their homes. And the holy book is opened at random and the message is read for the day. In the evening, it is closed, put to rest. So it's given a lot of homage and respect. And one thing we need to emphasize is that this holy book incorporates the verses, the voice, not only of the Sikh gurus, but also of Hindu saints and Muslim Sufis. So it is really the paradigm of a very pluralistic tradition. This is really kind of embodies pluralism because when the Sikhs bow in front of it, anybody bows in front of it, you're really cherishing treasuring the common humanity, the common spirituality, the common religion that we all share. So to me, the scripture is very significant. That's what I work on and I do translations of it. So um, as we go on, uh, this, the starting point of this huge book is 1430 portfolio pages is Ik Onkar. And this is one being is, one being. And I want to make it, I, I want us to emphasize that because it's not the same one as one God of the Judeo Christian world. That is monotheistic, yes, but it's a God which is out there, so to say, heavens and so forth. This one is out there and within us, you and me, in the ant, just what you said about uh, in Jainism, what we just heard, in the elements, one sense creatures, five sense creatures, everybody partakes of this ultimate reality. So it's not a theos in that sense, a reality out there, but a reality we all are a part of. So to me, that oneness is very significant and to kind of create gender neutral translations. That's what I've really been doing and um, translating without God, Lord, soul, because these little tiny little words, these are incorporated in mainstream translations and they really create a lot of aberrations. This is not one is not God. This is Ik, this is Krishna, this is Buddha, this is Nirvan, this is Rahim, Khuda, Allah, Goddess, God. Everybody is a part of it. So God does not quite do well. And sometimes the word Lord is overly used. And what does Lord do? It kind of gives you kind of an authorita authoritarian figure out there. And 
this is this is all full of love you and me and me and you what difference can there be so it's much more of an intimacy rather than that distance and authority that kind of divides a subject from the object so i don't like the word lord and soul that again is a tiny little word but again soul you know somehow the translators add the word bride soul you know it takes away the palpability this is all about senses we are body we are humans it's kind of oriented towards this world not the heavens out there and so somehow using the word soul it creates a binary mind body body soul etc and creates unnecessary havoc and to me translations should be as simple as as close to the original as possible and using these terms does not do where did i start out i started out my work can you see the screen um this is this is the guru gobind singh bhavan i don't know if anybody has visited it it's in patiala it's at the punjabi university and uh, swasti bhattacharya the um, dr bhattacharya was the person who was in charge of i think hinduism or buddhism she was uh, the professor so this is uh, my father was the first chairman of this department he had been at the center for world religions with wilfred cantwell smith and so forth as you some of us have been here the panelists have been um and he was very enchanted by that kind of world religions where everybody is together so this building was built in 1969 that's when its foundation stone was laid by the president of india that time and it's built in the shape of a kind of a ship with five different sails so it has hinduism islam sikhism jainism buddhism and christianity and symbolizing and there's kind of um, flame on the top symbolizing that they're going to the same goal and there's water all around and within each of them there are cubicles for for scholars there is library there are meditation rooms and in the middle there's a big seminar room where they would have lectures and so forth and i remember in 1969 uh, they had a, a seminar on guru nanak and world scholars came over to the our little town of patiala so this is where i started i was um, um, you know i was a young tot and so some people came over i met them and they told me about schools in america so i was very ambitious in those days not anymore uh, in those days yes so i was 14 when i came to a little high school in virginia and i wanted to study sikhism but of course there was none but a very good uh, professor a uh, teacher of religion she had been a student at harvard and she got me very very psyched for religion and that's when i went on to wellesley and work more and more but where does the academic study of sikhism begin it begins I just want to share with you this is something I I I recently worked on these are little narratives about guru nanak stories stories you know this this is not history but stories have their own you know importance and I think they speak about history they talk about reality more than reality can more than history can so this is guru nanak uh, first day at school and for teachers i really would like to emphasize that they should be used in in academia because they're very subtle they tell truths you know we all know stories are how we think how we imagine uh, these are not little you know these are not to be ignored our world is based on stories um, i think it was muriel rukaiser who said you know the famous feminist poet and the world is not made up of atoms the world is made up of stories and these are stories but they carry real truths to me this little story conveys the very origins of the sikh tradition so guru nanak this is the first painting in these in this manuscript that i was working over this is his first day at school and he's carrying his little slate you know that wooden board and he's going to write and so forth you can see little kids and he's being welcomed but he's disenchanted with education why because it's the same old patterns of education that is being given and so he does not want it and there are many you can see there's a, the same painting from different regions there's another one from victorian albert here you can see a more classical more mughal style and there's even a little kid you can see being punished there you know in that corporeal position and guru nanak is leaving he does not want to be in the school because it's all books and the teachers telling you giving you all that old kind of rote education that even sometimes many of us 
teachers do. So it was not that. To me, the pedagogy, Nanak's pedagogy, the whole Sikh pedagogy is based. So at that time, what the little fellow, you know, what he tells his teacher is, I don't want to have anything to do with it. With love as pen, awareness the scribe, question the guru and write down the answer. So what is at the root of it? Questioning, quest. The word Sikh, the religion of the Sikhs. Sikh, what does that mean? Somebody who's a seeker, somebody who does not have the answers. Guru Nanak never said, I have the answer. He made people question, question to be critical, not taking things as they are, but really reflecting upon that. And actually um, the, the finale to the holy book, you know, the first starting point is one being only. And the end is this whole thing is given as a platter with three dishes, truth, contentment, and reflection. So we have to have to think about these things, reflect on them. So what I'm saying is love is the pen. So education begins with love. It's not conflict. It's not antagonism. So whatever we do, and that too, I, I really, I've been teaching at an undergraduate school. I, I really, I love my students. I love what I teach. And it's really kind of, it's not, even, even if there's a little bit, actually in the Katopanishad too, right? Um, the prayer, how does it begin with? Maybe, may there be no, no friction, no conflict between students, maybe be together. So the togetherness, that kind of love being on the same plane is really crucial to education. And Guru Nanak says that, so with love is pen, awareness is the question and write. And writing too, you know, it's we have to know something to write things down. So that to me is the center of pedagogy. That's what I try to practice. Here is some translation. This is the evening hymn. And I want to see, what I want, um, want to emphasize to the teachers and so forth is that we cannot just study religion. Here's religion, but we, not, you know, we are in the West. We want to make it kind of engage people. I mean, this is what I was just hearing our, um, our first panelist uh, in Buddhism talking about Bhante Kushilaji. You were speaking about offering you know, offering, offering, what do we do? So this evening hymn is an offering where the sky is our platter, the lamps, the little lamps that we have are our sun and moon, pearls of stuff. So what Guru Nanak is saying is, you know, this is arti, you know, that are the platter rather than in our hands, it's up in the skies. So the skies are common to all of us, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, everybody Jewish. So we are together in this. This is the offering we are making, the sandal scent and vegetation. You explained it beautiful, beautifully, Bhante Kushalaji. So I want to say it's the same thing Guru Nanak is saying in that evening hymn. So, but, but it's kind of a universal. Everybody's doing it because the platter is not in the hand. It's really the skies. So that's the evening hymn. Uh, what I want to make is how, is, how, how to make the Sikh a message, pluralistic message accessible. So one is scriptural poetry. And it cannot be, we, we, you know, sometimes even the Sikhs, you know, oh, this is, this is the holy book, and which is very, it is holy, but holiness means to share it with the world. I want it to be read. So have translations, read it as poetry. You don't have to read it as oh, sacred poetry and secular poetry. To me, there's no difference. You know, it's, it's, we are, it's, it's language itself, what it does to us. So to read poetry, to have stories for children, those Janam Sakis are beautiful narratives about Guru Nanak. They kind of partake of our human spirit. Visual art is very significant. Music, because most of the scripture has been put into musical rags and music brings people together. So emphasize the musical and film, because film is visual and we need so various avenues of doing it. Quickly to say, these, these are my early books because I've been working on feminism. I've written several more since then. But to me, looking at the feminist uh, aspect of the tradition has been very important because that's something forgotten. Um, here is Sikhism, here is the music part that we see. Um, this is, again, uh, people don't know much about her, but here is Amrita Shergil. She had a Hungarian uh, mom and a Sikh dad. So Catholic Jewish mother, Sikh father, and she was a great artist. And uh, I think the world needs to know her 
her, you know, recognize her. Um, and the Sikhs themselves need to recognize her. And here is the painting that she did of the musicians, Sikh musicians. Uh, another famous artist is uh, Arpana Kaur. She's living in Delhi, a great philanthropist. Here you can see her making uh, Guru Nanak. And we cannot forget Mardana's, Muslim Mardana was uh, Guru Nanak's constant companion. And here he's cutting off the rituals and so forth that were kind of uh, bonding people, kind of, um, what should I say, imprisoning people, rituals and so forth, kind of freed people off. And that's what Guru Nanak is. And so she's kind of portraying in that way. Um, this is another Sikh, Sikh twins. Here they do uh, this, you know, how Sikhism is all over the world and how that is being celebrated in London. They are both twin sisters. They do great works of art. And here you can see the Hindu God back there, Virgin Mary here, uh, uh, um, Guru Gobind Singh here, uh, uh, Lord Buddha there, uh, the Last Supper of Jesus Christ back there. And then you see a, a snowman wearing a turban. So that's kind of unique, you know, how new, we need new patterns. I'd never imagined a snowman wearing a turban, but the sisters did that. And I think that's great. So langar is very important in Sikhism. Sevas, we were talking about earlier, uh, I think Dr. Mr. Bandhan Rapurwala was speaking about seva, selfless service, and langar sitting together and eating is very significant. Langar to me, savoring the food and sensing the divine, going hand in hand. Um, and here, you know, the, it's called the world's largest eatery. I think somebody, a New York Times wrote about uh, um, the Golden Temple. So here langar is prepared. You can see how huge it is. All day long, langar is served in gurdwaras, uh, even in San Francisco. Go anytime, anybody, everybody is fed. And during COVID, they had oxygen langars. So here they have uh, uh, mouth-watering jalebis. So that's part of langar too, sweets and so forth, because the divine is everywhere to be celebrated. And here are my students at the Golden Temple, Kobe students. I'm very fond of them. One is studying. He just got his master's at, uh, from the Divinity School at Harvard, and she's just got married and somewhere working in Colorado. So that's it. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry if I went over. I tried to finish it as soon as possible. Sorry. That's okay. That was wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, we, we now have time for questions. Um, I think all four of these were absolutely amazing. I feel like I've learned so much. I'm sure you all have too. Um, if people have questions, you can raise your hands. There's a raise hand function on Zoom, or you can put them in the chat. We do have a good 10 to 15 minutes for questions. <laughs> while people are coming up with them. And while we're on the topic, I can ask Dr. Singh, I just, like literally just yesterday, I think got a recommendation from a colleague for a new set of 24 video episodes of Guru Nanak's life that are on a website here. I'm, I'm putting it in the chat called yes. GuruNanak.com. Do you know anything about these? Have yeah, you I have not watched, I, I received them too, but I've just been so kind of, <laughs> crazy busy. I haven't had a chance to look at them. Yes, yes, yes. I just I, was traveling too for a whole month and just got back, but. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so so these are available. I didn't know if you had, a, yeah, if you had heard, but I have from a an old PhD advisor of mine who said that they're worth seeing, absolutely said that they're visually stunning and wonderful. So I will make that available. Okay, we have our first question here. Why do caste systems still exist if the mindset is that all are welcome with the example of the four doors? Excellent question. And that's where my criticism lies, you know, and, and, and because the scripture says no caste, but we jump on that bandwagon and there is caste. First thing anybody, when somebody is getting married, what caste do they belong to? And I think it's really kind of, we have not matched our ideals with our practices. And the ideal, the mindset is still all ancient, you know, the, from the ancient, ancient times, those caste system that we have, uh, you know, inherited and a part of and we have not kind of liberated ourselves from. That's why that Arpana course painting, which 
the ritual is being cut off. We really need to think what Guru Nanak brought new and we don't quite see it. And it's the same old patriarchal system, old layers of, you know, patri andros androcentricism that has been there. And I think British colonialism th made things worse, actually, if anything, because you wanted the patriarchs, you know, the strong soldiers and so forth. And it really gave it a very uh, hyper-masculine uh, attitude to the Sikh world. And so caste and all that came into play and so forth. So I, I am totally with you. It shouldn't be. And that's what I keep writing. My whole work and inclusive gender, inclusive translations are to be look at the message of the gurus and let's try to match the practices with the ideology. Yes. And I think um, I think I'm going to direct the question also to Swamiji. I know that Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism have all had their own positions on caste. We ha we've had a lot of questions this week. Uh, about the caste system and how to deal with it as a K-12 teacher, how to talk about it with their students. So Swamiji, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that delicate subject. Okay, so you are talking to me? Uh, no, actually I am, I am talking to Sadak Vandan. Thank you. I do uh, agree with you that it's a really delicate subject. Uh, back at Harvard, I took a course called Race and Caste, and uh, it made me realize how important these topics are that are affecting millions of lives every single day. Um, so the important idea behind this is, like in our Swamina Hindu tradition too, since a lo long, long time, we have been trying to eradicate caste system, uh, but it is so ingrained in in even in Indian society or more specifically Hindu society. And as Nikki Singh said that it, this is this bandwagon that everybody is on. But yeah, we just have to be cautious when we talk about race and caste. That's all I got. Thank you. Um, Professor Chaitanya Pragyad, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes. So as uh, uh, what we say, Sadha Kumandan has said, similarly in the Jain scriptures, it is said clearly <clears throat> by Mahavir that uh, there is no such caste system uh, which is by birth. It is all created by humans and uh, it is uh, actually to set a social order who has to work what kind of thing. And that's why on the basis of the abilities or competency, or you can say uh, working efficiency of different people, this class, class system, or you can say caste system has uh, come into existence, but it has no worth uh, in that sense. It is not given by God or it is not by, by birth. It is all human creation. So we have to see always humans up then caste. So humanity must be up of all the different caste races and colors. And we have to give respect to all people as a human being. Are there other questions either to put in the chat or you can raise your hand to ask a question? Also say something about this. Um, of course, Bhante. From Buddhist tradition, otherwise people will think that we don't have that problem, but we do. Um, though, although the Buddha completely refused the caste system, uh, saying that it is not by birth, someone is high class or low caste, it's by the behavior, like those who steal, um, have bad behavior and they can be labeled as you know shudras or whoever uh, but when they abandon those behaviors and um, become pure they are in high class again so anybody from any caste uh, should be allowed to enter the ordination and as soon as uh, it's like four rivers merging all together and becoming one one ocean um, when you enter the order, uh, when you become a monk from any caste system, any of the four, 
you are just the ocean you are just a son of a shakyan uh, shak uh, shakyan gautama uh, but again in sri lanka it's not as strong as in india but we have that problem especially um one thing to highlight is that when someone becomes a monk i didn't know this they check your surname and uh, accordingly you are granted permission to enter this temple or that temple but most candidates are not aware of it until after you become a monk and then they become aware of the differences but they make peace with it and i think um, i think uh, the because the buddha was from a royal a subordinate kingdom or some place like that he had that voice but others who are not from such high class uh, families aren't able to make a voice um, and that is why i think ambedkar tradition came into being uh, him him uh, emphasizing the importance of abandoning these beliefs and teaching that we all being belong in human class and are to you know one and can survive all together and reach nirvana together um, so that's my five cents thank you thank you there is another question for you because you showed um pictures of small children who are monks and nuns and the question is how are children selected to become monks or nuns i'm adding nuns and the path that they follow Oh, that's a great question. Um, they are, mm, I wouldn't say selected. Actually, they are sent by villagers to the temple because their parents have abandoned them, or there is family issues. Their mom is working in Middle East, and dad is abusing this child, or they are orphans. So poverty is a huge um, problem in some villages. So they are. not selected by monks they are just sent to the temple but some occasions monks would visit in my case actually i was uh, i was willing to become a monk seeing these happy faces of smiling monks uh, but my father would not allow me to enter the order um, in that in such a young age uh, but he allowed me to visit the temple uh, or spend overnight at the temple but if he was aware of all the child abuse stuff that was happening in temples uh, when children are you know given to the under the authority of monks he would not you know permit me to even spend the night at the temple but you know fearing that something would happen um but um when i was 16 i made the decision to abandon the lay life and my lay name and become a monk but even at that my father strongly opposed the idea and i did not speak to me for 5 years uh, because i made that decision he i was the hope of the family thinking that you know i will support the family he read the horoscope with the help of someone and they said something like you know this will be the supporter for the family and don't let him become a monk i did help the family later and you wouldn't believe that my father is now a buddhist monk um, <laughs> anyways so children in you know many we have a culture called pirivenas which are schools for monks and um, they i see you know many poor children are selected by the villagers and sent to the temple for better education and hoping that they will perhaps when they grow up they'll get a degree and they will quit being a monk and go back to uh, lay life and live a normal life that happens a lot in sri lanka and some have you know some are expressing their you know willingness to become a monk you know maybe they have past life memories or some some closeness to monks and then parents are willing you know willing to send them to the temple and another times you know when they are misbehaving at home they those are also sent to the temple so to discipline them Uh, and some in some cases it goes right that they learn well and they get disciplined and in in especially in my brother's case it got worse uh, he was sent to but not to become a monk he was sent as a child to the temple for studies but i think um, it never worked well for him uh, i think he never studied well after that and 
we have Bandon living in the temple. So it it right within my family, I have many stories to share about just this. So anyway, thank you. I don't want to take too much time. But thank you. Thank you all for sharing. I think that may be all the time that we have, but um, your story, I have to say, sounds a lot like Siddhartha Gautama's story. So <laughs> it's, um, it's really amazing to hear a story like that in modern times. So although I spent some time in Sri Lanka uh, and met a number of people whose parents encouraged them into the monastic life. And I met a number whose parents absolutely didn't want them to go into the monastic life. So I appreciate you expressing that. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much to all the presenters. I think um, we can end the recording now.